Tonight we'll show you PIV Key, a gang hideout and stash spot off Belize's coast where big guns and drugs were stashed. And a PG cop is accused of molesting a 15-year-old boy inside the DVU office. The commissioner calls it disgusting. Plus, her adopted daughter died of malnutrition, neglect and abuse. We'll tell you how many years American Anke Doem got today. Also, his police stood back as a man lay dying on Flamboyant Street on Monday night. But what would Chester have done? You'll hear his answer. We've got details of these and other stories in our newscast for tonight, Wednesday, April 17, 2024. Good evening. With you on news, I'm Indira Crack. This newscast is brought to you by Cellular World, your authorized Samsung distributor. The April sale is now at Cellular World. Enjoy massive savings store-wide and tech your luck when you get a chance to get cash back with our scratch and win tickets giveaway. Ask about our unbeatable low prices guarantee with budget phones starting as low as $49. Android starter phones starting at an all-time low price of just $115. Redmi gaming phones starting at $359. Samsung A-Series lead offers starting at just $269. Fully backed up by one-year local warranty. Plus, the newly added ZTE, Infinix, Logic, and Techno Spark phones now available countrywide. But that's not all. We've got you covered with something for everyone. Kids' tablets, smart TVs, speakers, headphones, and earbuds, gaming consoles, smart watches, accessories, and so much more. Visit any of our stores in Belize City, Del Pan, San Pedro, and now in Orange Walk to start shopping today. Or shop with us via our virtual store through Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp at 615-5141. Don't miss out. We got the deal for you. Every day, we access energy for cooling, lighting, and powering our electrical appliances and devices at work and at home. During cooler months, we rely less on cooling appliances such as fans and air conditioners. However, during warmer months, as the temperature and humidity rises, we use more energy to cool our spaces and our appliances and electrical devices work harder than they do during the rest of the year. When the months become hotter, let's all practice energy conservation. Here are a few changes that you can make to manage your energy use. Check that all appliances and electrical devices are working efficiently. Turn lights off when not in the room. Unplug chargers, appliances when not in use. Turn off fans and TVs. Use energy-saving light bulbs such as LEDs. And look for the Energy Star products when purchasing appliances and electrical devices. These easy changes can reduce energy use and costs. You can also monitor your energy use during the month by reading your meter and calculating the reading using BEL's bill calculator on our mobile app or by visiting our website. Let's all save energy. The BEBL presents its mega All-Star Sunday. Sunday, April 21st at the Belize Civic Center. Gates open at 4 p.m. and showtime is at 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., we kick off with the Cellular World three-point shootout. <laughs> For a whopping $1,000 cash and a Samsung phone, 6.45 p.m. is the Nando's Slam Dunk Contest. It's over, ladies and gentlemen. For a humongous $2,000 cash. And at 7.30, all the big stars from the different teams will collide in the Rude Boy All-Star Classic to see who will win the mega cash and bragging rights. Hey, that one goes down. There will be halftime giveaways including TVs, fans, microwave, and more. Plus, mega performance by Britney. Britney Star. 
So mark it on your calendars and get your tickets for the BEBL All Star Sunday. Sunday, April 21st at the Belize Civic Center. Sponsored by Room Boy, Cellular World, Nando's, Channel 5, Dolphin Production, Channel 7, Love FM, Krem, and Maya Island Ear. These charter means aren't from We're navigating along the coast. This morning, the 2023. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Shirley Kalsil, and here's what's ahead for you on Southern News Tonight. We've got details of these and other stories in our newscast for tonight. Good evening. With your news, I'm the bureaucrat. Please, you're watching the Nation Station, Channel 7. Express is a service that allows you to perform financial transactions conveniently at your neighborhood stores countrywide. Enjoy the convenience of cash withdrawals, bill payments, credit card payments, top up, or transfer between your accounts. All you need is your Atlantic Bank Visa debit card along with an ID. Non Atlantic Bank customers can also enjoy the service by paying with cash. Atla Express is easy convenient, secure, and near you. Nando's Wholesale is the distributor for the full line of Badia spices, including the original complete seasoning, the perfect combination of ingredients and spices prepared to enhance the natural flavor of your favorite foods. Also, cinnamon powder for all your desserts, fruits, and beverages, and as special dishes. All these are available in commercial sizes or restaurant packaging. Nando's products are available at your local retailer or contact us at 222-5000. From Corzal to Toledo, Nando's is proud to be serving Belize as its number one wholesale distributor for over 35 years. Wake up to positivity and inspiration. It's a fresh and diverse twist on your mornings. Tune in to Sun Up on 7 every weekday morning at 6.30 a.m. right here on your nation station, Channel 7. Please, you're watching The Nation Station, Channel 7. Police have struck at the heart of one of the city's deadliest gangs. Yesterday, they uncovered PIV's stash spot and hideout, which is on an island off the coast of Belize City. Three persons, including the man considered the gang's co-leader, Edwin Drive Flowers were on the island where police found a gun and drugs. A larger stash of weaponry was found on an adjoining quay. Tonight it stands as one of the biggest bust of a gang stash spot in memory. The commissioner gave us a briefing two hours ago. Searches were conducted on that island and uh, the search led to the discovery of 12,000 grams of cannabis. Um, it was parceled off in a number of parcels and uh, 2,300 grams of cocaine. Um, that was in two separate kilo size um, parcels and uh, one 223 rifle. On the island, police also found three individuals um, from the PIV area. Those persons and uh, the drugs and firearm were brought to Belize City for processing and uh, the three individuals have since been arrested and charged for drug trafficking and uh, for um, keeping unlicensed firearm. We went and conducted searches on two other islands, um, which we believe the PIV gang members have some connection to. And uh, on one of those islands, we found one M4 carbine rifle, one assault 5.7 caliber rifle, one, two, two, one 22 rifle, 
one 1.40 caliber handgun and one nine millimeter handgun. So a total of five firearms were found, three of which are rifles and two handguns. No one was on that island, and so those items will be deposited as found property. Be close about the firearms. Are they clean or were they stolen? We know the M4 carbine is a military grade rifle. Um, we're still doing our checks to verify if those firearms are um, stolen. I, I don't think the M4 carbine, unless it's if it was stolen from the military, um, would be stolen. Neither would the um, 5.7 rifle. Um, the handgun, again, um, for the caliber is not usually licensed and uh, 9mm is usually licensed, so we'll be running some checks. Did the events, did the murder of um, the young man Jigger on Monday night, did that trigger an increased seriousness from the police to say, you know what, we will strike them and we will strike them hard? Certainly, Jews, with the, the amount of shootings that um, we have seen where PIV members are implicated. I, I had to adapt your style and uh, use a few explicit to be able to make people understand that we need to find um, these members from PIV and uh, send them to prison under the SOE. Um, just like you, we have heard of an island that was that we believe was used by was being used by PIV. Um, but we had visited that island before and uh, nothing was there. This one that we found uh, this particular individual on is different than, than the one that we have heard of before. So um, it's a total different island than the one we have heard of before. Does the island have an owner? Mm -hmm. um, at this time, we will have to do the necessary research to ascertain um, who is the owner of the island. I believe that when they would get their shipment of drugs, it would be taken to the island and then they would bring from the island to the city in smaller quantity. Do you feel that you all have struck at the heart of one of the most powerful gangs and will this have, do you believe, a meaningful effect, effect on mitigating violence in the city? Well, I, I would hope that it will. Um, I, I am not going to be naive to think that this is all the firepower that they have. We still believe that they have um, additional firepower and that's the reason why we had gone on to other islands that we believe that they may have some items concealed. Um, we will continue to work and develop our information and. Uh, and certainly we will go after them again and see what else we can retrieve. And while police continue to search, they will also have to reassess their relationship with leaders like Edwin Drive Flowers, who is an active member of the LIU. The commissioner described the complicated relationship. Will the Minister of Home Affairs extend the SOE? Um, I'm not sure at this time, but I wish that it would be extended. I, I do believe that there is still more that we need to do in terms of carrying out our necessary investigation against these, um, these gang members to see what we can do to put some of them away for a very long time. Um, I believe that some of these young men, as much as we are trying with them, they don't want to change and uh, the society is suffering for it. Are you able to speak about the police's relationship with Edwin Drive Flowers? We know that he is a prominent gang leader. We know he's someone that has been working with the LIU. We know that he's someone who has worked with you. Um, and these are complicated individuals. And um, explain to me, how is it that we reach where we are with him? where you know you, you feel like the relationship is is unsalvageable or irretrievable as i have said Jews, the, the liu is a vehicle that we are using to see how we can change the minds and hearts of some of these street figures and uh, i can see where in some instances it is working the liu is not a shield for anybody and so I don't want no one to believe that because a particular person is a member of LIU or works with LIU, that they are immune from um, criminal liability. And so yes, Drive um, is an employee of LIU or he works closely with LIU. Um, he's one of the persons in the program and uh, we have tried our best to work with him. And it goes back to what I have said, that we, we police with a double-edged sword um, where we offer the soft or the dull side to those persons who demonstrate that they want to change. But once they 
continue to perpetrate criminal acts, then we have to use a sharp side of the sword and, and cut them off. Might you all have been nurturing that relationship for too long and been offering the soft side when persons associated with PIV were using those same guns to commit murder out there while you all are here with the soft and conciliatory approach? I, I would not say that, Jules, because the truth is um, we have had a number of SOEs and um, in most of those SOEs, the, the PIV members go, goes up. Um, I think this would be the fourth SOE that um, drive and battery would be a part of. So it goes to show that we have not been, as you would want to say, uh, cozy with them. The three persons found on the island are 41-year-old Edwin Flowers, 32-year-old Kenyon Domingo, Dominguez, that is, and 25-year-old Gaston Barrow, who is also with the LIU. And in other police news tonight, a 29-year-old police officer is under interdiction after being accused of raping a 15-year-old boy. It happened in Punta Gorda, where a 15-year-old male student went to the police station with his mother to report that a 29-year-old Belizean police officer had sexual relations early on Sunday morning with him. Police today arrested and charged PC Marcos Chi for an unnatural crime. He was taken to court where, due to the nature of the crime, no plea was taken from him and he was remanded until June. Reports reaching 7 News say that the officer was stationed at the DVU office and had taken the young man there to have sex. We asked the commissioner about it today and he had no words. We warn you, this story uses adult language. Well, it's extremely disturbing, um, disgusting. I, I don't know how to describe it. Um, we just need to do what needs to be done, Jules, honestly. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm last of words. And that is not something that happens every, um, often um, to describe what actually happened. Police Constable Marco Che, who is assigned, or who was assigned to the domestic violence unit in Punta Gorda town invited a young man of 15 years old to his office and uh, his office is located on the upper flat of the Punta Gorda town police station and uh, in his office he performed anal sex with the 15 year old. The 15 year old and his father reported the matter to the police and uh, Marcos Che has since been arrested and charged for unnatural crime. Sir, you have worked tirelessly to try and polish up the public image of the police department. Uh, how does this sort of thing, how do you feel it works against those efforts? Well, I, I think that it's certainly true among Kirinch into the work that we have been doing to try and uh, restore trust and confidence. It is going to take a very long time to restore that confidence for parents to want to send their children to the police station in Punta Gorda town. But I want to assure the parents and the people of Punta Gorda town that we are going to be doing all we can to make sure that this police officer is brought to justice and that there is no reoccurrence of this issue. Che has also been placed on interdiction and will face disciplinary charges. Turning back to Belize City gang-related crime, yesterday we shared with you the details on Michael Usher's Monday night murder. The public was outraged at the police's apparent lack of urgency in rushing the dying victim to the hospital. While Usher's mother believes her son could have lived if he was moved sooner, we asked the compo what he would have done in this situation. And he discussed the perplexing issue of what police should do in these life and death situations. I am a bit disturbed because of the comments from Channel 7. Um, I, I watched the, the Sun Up show this morning and uh, there are two hosts um, alluded to the fact that the young man died because the police did not take him to the hospital, which I believe is very, very unfair. Um, the murderer is let off the hook 
and the police who tried their best daily to keep us safe are the ones who are now being blamed for the murder. But um, I guess that is what sells the negativity against the police. In this particular instance, um, the ambulance had been called and the ambulance was on its way to the location. And I believe that's the reason why the police did not move the person because the ambulance was already on its way. We have had instances where we would transport the person or persons to hospital where it's a long distance and ambulance would take a very long time to come. And uh, the ambulance and the police would then meet along the way and then the police would trans transfer the injured person to the ambulance and then the ambulance carry the person forward. Um, my thing is, it's damn if you do and damn if you don't. Um, if the police had picked up the young man and took him to the hospital and he died along the way, then you'd have heard that the police caused his death still. Um, so there's nothing that we could have done that would have avoided us from getting the blame. If you were at that crime scene on Monday night, what would a young Chester Williams have done? I would have taken him to the hospital. So while the couple would not have left Usher to die in the street, the question police are asking is what was he doing on that street in the first place? Usher is from Majestic Alley and Flamboyant Street is PIV turf, definitely enemy territory. The compo says he was lured there by a female and police might just have to release surveillance footage in order to locate her. When I was um, notified of it, um, I asked the same question to myself. Um, what was he doing in PIV area? Um, for the simple fact that we know that PIV and uh, uh, Majestic Ali do not see it why, and there is that issue between them. Um, again, from all indications, we, we know that he was lured to the area by a woman. We do have the video footage of him leaving Majestic Alley with that woman. Um, we are still trying to identify who that woman is. We have the, the, the video I might eventually release to the public to, to help us to identify who she is. Um, but we need to identify that woman to see what she can give the police in terms of um, why she took him to the PIV area. Um, but again, I'm not going to say that it's an act of jealousy, but rather I believe that it is more a gang issue because he is from Adesik Ali, he was in the PIV area, and uh, the two do not see it why they do have conflict with each other. Eleven days ago, Belmopan, mother defended herself and child against a robber in Independence Park. Gilda, a body, and her daughter were returning to their vehicle when they were held up by 49-year-old Ronald Gibson, who had a knife. Fearing for her life, a body pulled out her licensed firearm and shot Gibson in his stomach. He survived initially, but Gibson passed away from his injuries on Tuesday night. And now the case has gone to the DPP. We asked the Compol today whether the claims of self-defense will stand. Well, from all indications, the investigation is showing that they, they um, acted in defense of herself and her child. Um, it happened that the person died a um, couple of days after. So what we'll do is what we normally um, would do is to put together the file and we send it to the DPP. Now, um, you know, uh, we always speak about the justified use of lethal force. And one of the issues is always proportionality. Clearly, the woman felt she was under grave mortal threat understandably it's she and her her daughter um but are you concerned that perhaps it will not meet that threshold of proportionality to use lethal force against someone who is who is holding you up to rob you i do not think so um the woman and her child were together the man accosted them to rob them she ordered him to stop he continued to make moves towards her. Generally, a man is stronger than a woman. She was armed with a weapon. Imagine him approaching her and uh, would have been able to hold on to her, get a hold of her firearm. He certainly would have over overpowered her, would have taken away that gun, and maybe would have killed her. I don't foresee an instance where her actions would not be deemed justified, but I'm not going to be the arbiter of that issue. Um, it is going to be left for the DPP. But from my legal standpoint, I do not see how that could happen. I believe she acted in self-defense. 
We'll let you know what the DPP advises. We'll take a break now. When we come back, she left her adopted daughter to die of malnutrition and abuse tonight. We'll hear how many years Anke Doem was sentenced to. And the commissioner apologizes to the man who says he is haunted by his wife because the authorities won't let him bury her two weeks later. Don't go away. Here's how to be a part of Benny's homecation in three easy steps. First, download the B-Bucks app and sign up to be eligible. It's fast and easy. Then, shop at any Benny's location or Benny's entity. Remember to choose products from our monthly homecation jackpot categories to earn entries. Now you can earn V-Bucks with purchases made and be a part of the Benny's Homecation Jackpot for a chance to win the $10,000 grand prize in December. Win the ultimate homecation with Benny's quality and savings. Take a minute. Imagine yourself in that long road trip in that dream vehicle. Right now, that dream may seem a bit far-fetched, but with Real Deal Auto Sales, that dream can be realized. We not only have quality and reliable vehicles, but affordable vehicles. Did someone say layaway? Yes! Call us today at 613-1889 to ask about our layaway plans or visit us at 2736 Hummingbird Highway. Belmopan, right across from the showgrounds. Be a boss with Real Deal Auto Sales. Upcoming enhancements to my social security. The new healthcare provider feature seamlessly connects healthcare providers, insured persons, and employers to facilitate the payment of sickness benefits. Here are the enhancements. Registered healthcare providers will create and submit online medical certificates using their healthcare provider accounts. Insured persons will receive a link to view the medical certificate to complete and submit their sickness benefit claim. And employers will receive an email notification of their employee's sickness claim. Also, the insured person and their employer will receive a copy of the claim decision letter after review. Healthcare providers, insured persons and employers are encouraged to create a portal account to access and benefit from these new services on My Social Security at ssbportal.org.bz. My Social Security online portal. Social Security at your fingertips. Hey Belize, come join us at the Belize Earth Day at Creatively Green Pop-Up happening at the Memorial Park on Saturday, April 20th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Shop from a wide selection of eco-friendly boots like Sol Handmade Clay Jewelry, Hello Body Belize, Naturally Belize Cosmetics, Belize Eco Bag, Zero Belize, and so much more. Enjoy delectable food and beverages from Don Ceviche, Iguana Stop, Brain Freeze Margaritas, just to name a few. Live performances by QB and Band, Britney Star, and Yes Talia. For more details, call us at 227-2420. The Belize Earth Day pop-up is brought to you by the Belize Tourism Board in partnership with the Belize City Council. Sponsors include DigiWallet, Coca-Cola, and the Belize Waste Control Limited. See you on April 20th at the Memorial Park. Wake up to positivity and inspiration. It's a fresh and diverse twist on your mornings. Tune in to Sun Up on 7 every weekday morning at 6.30 a.m. right here on your nation station, Channel 7. It's the morning show you don't want to miss. Atla Express es un servicio que te permite realizar transacciones financieras cómodamente en comercios cerca de ti. Con Atla Express puedes retirar efectivo, realizar pagos de facturas y tarjeta de crédito, comprar recargas y transferir entre tus cuentas. Solo necesitas una identificación válida y tu tarjeta de débito Visa de Atlantic Bank. Si no eres cliente de Atlantic Bank, 
siempre puedes disfrutar de este servicio pagando en efectivo. Atla Express. Es fácil, conveniente, seguro y está cerca de ti. Daddy, daddy. Buy me one taro con some. Se You want egg? Uh -uh. Oh, you want taro con some. Aha. Uh -huh. Taro con some. The best taste and the best price. Less fat, more flavor. Taste the savings. Love the flavor. Available at your favorite supermarkets near you. Yeah. These charter means aren't We're navigating along the coast. This morning, the 2023. In the Good evening. Good evening. I'm Shirley Kalsil, and here is what's ahead for you on 70s tonight. We've got details of these and other stories in our newscast for tonight. Good evening. With your news, I'm a bureaucrat. Please, you're watching the Nation Station, Channel 7. Please, you're watching The Nation Station, Channel 7. She was found guilty of child cruelty in early March, almost seven years after her adopted daughter, 13-year-old Faith Lynn Cannon, died of neglect, malnutrition, and physical and sexual abuse. Today, Anke Doem was sentenced to five years in prison for child cruelty. Doem reacted with confusion and shock after being told she's going to jail. But she was lucky to have only gotten five years since the offense carries a prison term of 14 years. In handing down his sentence, Justice Derek Sylvester noted that Doem showed no remorse for the death of her daughter and has still not accepted liability for her action. Justice Sylvester was also of the view that Doem needed psychological help and must be considered a danger to children in society. So he added to the sentence that she must participate in all rehabilitation programs at the prison. Today, Doem appeared very frail as she walked towards the prison van. The court noted that she has blood cancer, which was diagnosed in 2018. As we told you last night, former City Councillor Albert Vaughan has been installed as City Administrator, despite the fact that six of the councillors are calling his appointment illegal. And while there is a public power struggle in City Hall, does it even extend to Cabinet, with Francis Fonseca backing Vaughan, while another minister is reportedly backing the six councillors who want the party Secretary General Lins Ford Castillo for the job? Today, Fonseca denied those claims and added that he did not encourage Vaughan to seek that post, but instead he would have preferred him to stay within the margins of Niche and his work in Freetown. No, 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 no power struggle. Um, I did not encourage uh, Albert to, to seek um, that post. Um, I supported him, of course, when he told me that he would. Um, but anybody who knows Albert uh, knows that he is his own man. Um, he makes his own decisions. He felt that he could contribute uh, and support the work of the mayor. Um, and therefore he, I think, applied for the post. Um, I did not encourage him to do so. In fact, selfishly, um, I would much prefer for Albert to, to focus on my work in Freetown, <laughs> um, as well as the work he does for us at Niche. Um, you know, but. You know, he made that decision and obviously uh, he's someone I respect, uh, someone I like and someone I support. Um, so that's where it is. And while Fonseca, of course, heaps praise on his most stalwart political operator, Albert Vaughn is not a man universally loved in the City Hall political caucus. As we told you, Vaughn's colleagues are even seeking an injunction against his appointment. But Fonseca claims he knows nothing about that and is sure that cooler heads will prevail. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, you know, I, obviously I think that would be counterproductive. Um, and, you know, I, I, I certainly hope that 
we don't reach that point um, and that whatever differences they have with the mayor um, that those can be resolved um, in a you know a common sense um, manner um, that serves the interests of, of the, the council uh, people want the council to be focused on work um, and people are not interested in political bickering but political bickering is like a foreign language in Fonseca's Freetown constituency, where the five-term representative is rumored to be looking for a successor. So, now that Vaughn is the new city administrator, could he parlay the senior post into some additional leverage on the campaign trail? Fonseca says he doesn't need the help. Well, I don't need any help to succeed in Freetown. We have a strong team in Freetown. Albert is a part of that team, um, but no, I mean, I don't need him to be in that, as I said, I didn't encourage him to do that. I would much rather him being on the ground, not being city administrator and being on the ground in Freetown and, and working as chairman of that constituency. Um, so no, there's no benefit to um, him being the city administrator for Freetown. Um, he, you know, he would work for all, all of the city. And while Fonseca doesn't need any help, he seems to be making sure his political point man keeps his next well-feathered. Vaughan will collect a hefty salary at City Hall and still be able to supplement that with a stipend from Niche, where he is a board member. We asked Fonseca about that. The only pay Albert gets at Niche is as a board member. That's the only, he's a member of the board of directors. They get a, a monthly stipend. Albert is not acting in any other capacity except a member of the board of directors of Niche. Um, so obviously if he takes on the role of city administrator on a full-time basis, obviously he will be limited in terms of the contributions that he can make to the work of Niche. Um, so yeah, that, but he's the only uh, payment that Albert receives from Niche is as a member of the board. And while Nitsch has had no president or director for about a year, our information is that Albert Vaughan was basically running the show there. Now that he's tied up at City Hall, who will do it? Fonseca says things are running just fine without a bigger boss. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I, it's not that we don't want a president, but I have always maintained that um, you want the right people, we want the, the right person. Um, Yasser Musa serves as an advisor to me as the Minister of Culture and an advisor to the board of Niche. Albert, of course, is a member of the board of, of directors. So it's not just them. They are working along with the entire board of directors. They're working with, along with our directors. We have very good directors of each institute of Niche and we have very good teams. So it's a collective effort. Um, and it's working well, it's working very well, um, you know, so, you know, at the appropriate time, um, you know, we will fill that post of president. But the truth is, uh, things are working well. Municipal elections were held six weeks ago and general elections are currently set for late 2025. And yet... The redivisioning report, which came to light last July, still hasn't made it to the House of Representatives. As we reported, the Belize Peace Movement, who are the claimants in the Supreme Court redistricting case, rejected the proposal. But the process has been stalled because it is at the preliminary level and the status quo politicians seem to be delaying it as long as they can. So today, the Belize Peace Movement held a press conference to apply some pressure they reiterated the reason for not accepting the proposal and expressed their concerns about the stall in the process. As you all know, almost a year ago, the proposals were laid before the National Assembly and immediately, of course, you, the media, caught on to it. And the response from most, including the Prime Minister, was that they were not in agreement, it did not meet international norms, uh, the highest deviation was San Pedro with uh, Belize Rural North with 35% above the median uh, of 6,100 and I believe seven at the time. So having heard all of these objections to the proposal, it still has not 
been looked at, debated, and sent back to the Elections and Boundaries Commission. And we see that as a disrespect to you all, the voters of this country, and certainly to the, ju to the, to the judiciary who, who mandated and told the, the government and the Elections and Boundary Com Commission to lay those proposals before July of 2023 to the government. Here's the problem. The Elections and Boundaries did their exercise. We went into the consent order and they said that they would dutifully put proposals to the National Assembly that will be consistent with the near equal standard. And of course, what do we expect? Legitimately, we expect it would be near 20% or below. We would have been, we had arguments and discussions amongst ourselves. If they go 15%, that would be fine. But here, the elections and boundaries presented us with a 35% deviation far from what we expected. So we dutifully and rightfully went to the court in an application to say, listen, this is not right. We want the court to enforce our rights by, from the concept of legitimate expectations. And this is important because if the elections and boundaries is afforded leeway to do, to pick any number they want, what will stop them next year from doing re redivisioning and then they'll pick 50% next year or 40%. But the BPM are not backing down. They tried to stop the 2020 election with an injunction, but the courts weren't on their side. Now, due to an error, they were alarmed that the case would have been struck out. While that has been resolved, Leslie emphasized that this process has not been without its tribulations. I just want to make reference to 2020 before the election. Our case at that time had an injunction, and so we filed the injunction to stop the election from taking place because we felt, and we know up to this day, that it would have been an unconstitutional election. You all will recall that we went into a, a fight. Um, the PUP brought their lawyers, Courtney and Coe and others. The UDP had their lawyers. And at the end of the day, they convinced the judge that they had spent millions on campaign and with these ordinary citizens could not um, stop this election. And in particular, one thing keeps in my mind. That one attorney said, why did you all take so long? Well, we had already been in court over a year. Okay, I have a question for this administration. Why have you all taken so long to do the redistricting. Just want to make reference to 2020 before the election. Our case at that time had an injunction and so we filed the injunction to stop the election from taking place because we felt and we know up to this day that it would have been an unconstitutional election. You all will recall that we went into a, a fight. Um, the PUP brought their lawyers, Courtney and Coe and others. The UDP had their lawyers. And at the end of the day, they convinced the judge that they had spent millions on campaign and with these ordinary citizens could not um, stop this election. And in particular, one thing keeps in my mind. That one attorney said, why did you all take so long? Well, we had already been in court over a year. Okay, I have a question for this administration. Why have you all taken so long to do the redistricting? And as Leslie mentioned, the BPM erroneously received an alert to appear in court for the case to be struck out. They sorted out the matter and stated that the only matter in the court is the consent order enforcement, which should be heard in the summer. But according to Saldiva, there are rumors of an early election looming and they are prepared to go back to court with another injunction. The application for strikeout, when it was received, there was calls made for clarification. Um, it has been brought to my attention that that was an error, that there was no application to strike out. In fact, none appeared on the portal. There's nothing to strike out. The claim has been brought to 
its conclusion with a consent order being put in place. The only thing left is for that to be carried through. Election boundaries want to argue that they have done their job by laying a proposal before Parliament. Parliament now has its prerogative. It will debate or not debate. And they're seeking to kick the can down the road and leave us in an unconstitutional state of affairs with a schedule that is clearly beyond what the Constitution allows. So that application for enforcement is just sitting there in court untouched? No, um, we actually have a date when that is going to be heard. Uh, it's supposed to be heard, I believe, in July. There is some word that there is a plan on having an election in November. At least that's what we are hearing. So if that is the plan, the Prime Minister has a certain number of days before that to, to actually make an announcement. So we have to time our filing of an injunction to coincide with whenever that time comes that he would make that announcement so it would not be a premature application. But even though they're prepared to try and stop any elections that pop up before the redistricting process is finalized, they can't do it alone. The BPM is now calling on Belizeans to put pressure on their area reps to force their hand and ensure that the proposal reaches the House of Representatives. This has been almost a year. July will make a year that the proposals have been laid. If you didn't like it, then reject it, send it back to the elections and boundaries and say, come back with the international norms. And that is what we want to approve. But every month, it's not on the docket for, to, to be, uh, for the sitting of the House, so it cannot be debated. And are we going to write exactly like what you said? You're going to keep pushing it back and pushing it back. And here we are waiting. So we filed for the consent order to be enforced. And uh, we're going to go back into court and say what we received from the Elections and Boundaries Commission does not meet the constitutional requirement, does not meet what the, the expert witness proposed. And instead of you doing a task force that is not even mentioned in the Constitution, like, like what they did, man, just give the man the job that already did it, and he can do it in a matter of hours, and we can have our elections constitutionally held. But we need people pressure, media pressure, every kind of pressure we can, and of course, ultimately, the court's pressure to have them do this thing the right way. Yesterday, you heard a husband's plea to bury his wife, whose body has been lying at the PG morgue for two weeks, waiting for a post-mortem. Miguel Chocó of Silver Creek says because he cannot bury her, his wife is haunting him. When we asked the compal about this today, he affirmed that he will intervene soon on behalf of Chocó. I have to apologize to Mr. Chocó, as you brought that up just a while ago. Um, he did call me yesterday and uh, made a complaint to me. And I had promised him that I was going to make some calls and get back to him. But I had been extremely busy and I totally forgot until you mentioned it just a while ago. Um, but I'm going to do that now as I get through from here to see how I can arrange to have his mother transported to Belize City to his wife. His wife. Well, the one who called me was a son. Um, one okay, of them, a son, yeah, yeah. son had called me um, to have his mother transported to Belize City to, for the post-mortem. Um, we don't control post-mortems. Many people believe that it's the police department that controls when post-mortems are going to be conducted. But that is done by the National Forensic Service, which is a total different department. We have no control over that. Um, Mr. Shaw is the head. I, I know that the National Forensic Service do have a lot of work. We have a number of um, sudden deaths. Then we have murders. Then we have persons who died in traffic accidents. And so their hands are extremely full. I, I can say that. Um, perhaps that's the reason why um, the, the, the body is being held up. But Mr. Cho told me you can contact the police to get a comment about their about police lack of mobiles to transport bodies from PG since last week. He doesn't manage that, the police. That should be no excuse, um, Jules. If that is the case, it should be no excuse. Um, PG police do have mobi mobile and they should be able to transport the body. And so I'm going to get on top of that right now. After the break, we'll take you inside the new Museum of Belizean Art. And Jules Vasquez looks at the long and complicated relationship between Shine Barrow and Sean P. Diddy Combs. Don't go away.
This newscast is brought to you by Cellular World, your authorized Samsung distributor. Skip the trip to the bank and perform cash withdrawals at your neighborhood store with Atla Express. Withdrawals are now free and customers can withdraw up to $300 daily. All you need is your Atlantic Bank Visa debit card along with an ID. Atla Express is easy, convenient, secure, and near you. Atlantic Bank, building the future together. Wake up to positivity and inspiration. It's a fresh and diverse twist on your mornings. Tune in to Sun Up on 7 every weekday morning at 6.30 a.m. Right here on your nation station, Channel 7. It's the morning show you don't want to miss.
Please, you're watching The Nation Station, Channel 7. In October of last year, Belize joined the Hearts in the Americas initiative led by the Ministries of Health of all 33 countries that participate with technical assistance from PAHO WHO. The aim is to tackle the leading cause of death in the region, which is cardiovascular disease. Today, the first training session was held and we heard more about it from the Deputy Director of Public Health and Wellness, as well as the local rep for PAHO. HEARTS is an initiative by WHO PAHO. And what HEARTS is, it's, it is a, a package, various packages that are geared towards addressing risk factors for the biggest reason of death really in the Caribbean and Belize, which is cardiovascular deaths. So what we're saying is that we understand that people are dying hypertension-related illnesses, like stroke, heart attack, chronic kidney diseases. Hearts is going to help us to address this problem, to be able to control hypertension and diabetes the way it should be. What Hearts is doing is putting very clear, easy protocols in place so that the physicians, the nurses, everybody can get on board. For example, Right now in Belize, um, if you're just diagnosed with hypertension, depending on which doctor you go to, you will have different medications. The heart's data shows that that doesn't work. You need to be on a specific set of medications for a specific set of time, and it needs to be adjusted in a specific way. So that in itself is a big difference. The other difference is the way we approach hypertension. Um, traditionally, we use um, manual cuffs, or we don't use validated devices, and everybody does it their own way. Having people do it one specific way helps us to determine who is hypertensive and who isn't. And if you're hypertensive, what is your true number? PAHO is providing the technical cooperation in terms of training, capacity building, helping to provide clinical guidelines, um, as well as helping to provide some of the equipment in terms of you know, the clinically validated blood pressure machines. Um, that the health facilities will use to measure high blood pressure, etc. It takes an integrated approach, and so it helps to strengthen health systems. It helps to coordinate the way the different categories of healthcare workers work together. It also helps to improve the way we relate to our patients. It helps to improve um, the coordination of services and standardize the quality of care because there are specific things that the Hearts Initiative requires. We have to standardize the quality of medicines. We have to standardize how blood pressure is measured. Um, we have to standardize the care that is given. It is a collection of voices, emotions and colors unlike any you've ever seen before. Today, Nitch along with stakeholders and artists from all over Belize came together to unveil its National Museum of Art, nestled inside the government house and curated to tell the story of a country evolving in art as it moves through history. Domari Lanza attended the opening. A total of 68 different art pieces hidden deep in the National Institute of Culture and History's vault now have a home on the walls of the government house. It's a renovated space designed for artists spanning decades and generations. From abstract to contemporary and modern art, each work that tells a story deserves to be marveled at. And so Niche, along with the Museum of Belize and the Houses of Culture, saw it fit to display these pieces where they will be appreciated. The museum that we currently have is the Museum of Belize, and that space is primarily dedicated to exhibiting the history and the culture of Belize. I know since I started working there, I've always been advocating to include art exhibitions in there. And um, it just progressed, you know, we, we realized the need to have a museum that's solely dedicated to the arts, you know. Um, while we do have the Museum of Belize and it will continue to be the Museum of Belize, um, 
the space is small, we don't have enough room to do everything, so this is why we have to advocate for different spaces. For the first exhibit that we were doing, we looked at the National Art Collection and we have almost 300 pieces in that collection. And what we wanted to do was to highlight um, the artists from the past, the present, and artists of today. One of the main goals that we're trying to achieve going forward when it comes to our exhi exhibits is to be more conscious of diversity and inclusivity. This is why if there was any artwork that we may have missed or we've lacked in the past, we are taking the opportunity to include them now in our national art collection. One of those artists spoke to us today about how she had a change of heart in her work after seeing it on display and receiving positive feedback from school children. Richard Holder had taken a picture of Aisha Gabriel and I saw the picture and I said, you know, her eyes are closed and she's really pretty. She has like dark blue eyeshadow. I want to try and paint this painting. And I painted it and I brought it to my show, but I really wasn't happy back then. This is like 15, 18 years ago. I wasn't happy with the way it came out. And the Institute bought a couple of my paintings for niche. And I told Miss Karen Vernon, I'm like, you know, Miss Karen, just, just keep this one, just store it in a bodega somewhere because I didn't feel like it was good enough. I, I felt like, uh, you know, I could have done better. So when I got here and I saw it, I was a little bit like mortified. I'm like, oh my God, that is like one of the worst paintings I've ever done. But then I stood back and I was outside by the window and kids were coming in and they're looking at it and they're saying, wow, that's beautiful. And there's a lady, I guess, that used to work at the cafeteria. She's like, I miss this painting. I loved looking at it every day. It was, I guess, being displayed at niche. And so now I see that like, Everybody like portrays it different. Maybe it doesn't look exactly like the person I wanted it to look like, but it's still a pretty girl. I guess it's a different interpretation of her. And now I appreciate it and I feel honored that she's being displayed here. Surely the exhibition has opened a new doorway in the art world for expansion and inclusion of other forms. The Minister of Culture says they hope to include a music section in the same building very soon. I think it's uh, amazing. I think it's fantastic. I think it's huge. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's a historic day for Belize. Um, you know, these are small steps in, in the bigger scale of, of the work we do in, with culture, but they're important steps because they give our artists, our Belizean artists, re and really an opportunity to, to showcase their creativity, their innovation. Um, you know, and anytime we have an opportunity to do that um, and to make a statement to the Belizean people that we respect our artists, we acknowledge their work, both present, future, and past, um, I think that's an important, important step. So this is a space um, for our artists. It's a space for the Belizean people. Um, and we want people to be proud of the work that our artists have created over many, many years. Um, so I'm absolutely excited about this initiative, you know, and it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning, as I have said in my remarks. Um, we want to expand beyond art. We want to go to a museum of music as well, Belizean music on the second floor um, to really, you know, look at a hundred years of Belizean music and record that history. Uh, so that Belizean people or students um, and the Belizean people can learn more about our artists and music and appreciate it. The exhibition will officially be open to the public tomorrow on April 18th. A fee of $10 will be charged to enter. And for those who cannot be there in person, the museum has created a portal where you can take a virtual tour. Like an electronic walk around where you can click on each piece and study it. Joe Marie Lanza, 7 News. You can find a link to the virtual tour on our website. And uh, while he hopes Miss Universe will take on the world and win, in the next few days, the Belize Territorial Volunteers may be pitted against the Guatemalan military. They will make one of their large expeditions up the river on April 27th. And there could be a showdown because, according to reports, right now, the Guatemalan military, Dayan. We asked the Minister of Foreign Affairs. His, his ministry will advise the volunteers to exercise caution. 
We're always, of course, monitoring that situation and we are aware of, of the activities taking place on the SAR soon. Um, so we're always concerned about that. Um, and, you know, we do our very best to ensure that we engage with any of our citizens who are going out there um, to try to guide them and, and, and try to ensure that they are safe. Um, we, of course, fully understand that we are in Belizean territory um, and we respect that. Um, but, you know, our objective as we move through this process of peacefully resolving this unfounded claim at the ICJ, as we move through that process, um, there are obviously still things that need to be worked out on the ground and out at the source tool. We have been calling for a long time for a sort of protocol to guide the activities of both countries on the source tool. Um, that has not materialized. Um, so we, you know, we have a good working relationship between our military, their military, and generally that, that serves our purpose. Um, so, you know, again, we will advise our friends from the ter territorial volunteers to, you know, exercise good discretion, good judgment, um, and be safe. And, and of course, we are here to support them. Of course, we've been hearing that talk about this sars protocol since 2019. Three successive ministers of foreign affairs have mounted it, but nada in terms of results. Fonseca says, despite all that, he remains hopeful. The discussion of a protocol um, has been around for, for much, more, much longer than that. Um, it, you know, this has been discussed. They've used different terms. But there's always been a um, discussion about how can we um, you know, negotiate some understanding, some understanding of how we patrol and use those waters um, so that we do not engage in any activities that um, either side may view as provocative. Um, so, no, the truth is, yes, as you said, we, um, our government over the past three years has been raising this issue. We've raised it with the OES, we've raised it with Guatemala. Um, Guatemala, of course, has gone through you know, an election cycle, the newly elected government. Um, you know, so we are, you know, the newly elected government, as you know, is, is just in office a few months. Um, we have engaged with them. And you know, there, there seems to be an opportunity for us to renew the dialogue about some agreement on the SAR soon. Um, so we remain hopeful. Um, and we are committed to working uh, with them. On Monday, we told you that Anthony Boots Martinez's recall petition was rejected. Well, he isn't given up just yet. He retained Attorney Richard Dickey Bradley, who sent a letter to the Chief Elections Officer. In that letter, it states that, quote, among the reasons listed for disapproving the signatures was that 188 signatures did not match with the Elections and Boundaries Department's records of registered electors. Mr. Martinez takes strong issue with this criteria as he had personally visited, contacted and witnessed the signatures on more than 90 percent of the petitions." End quote. The letter also states that Martinez went back to the 188 petitioners with a justice of the peace to confirm that they did sign by having them also sign individual statutory declarations. And today he held a press conference stating that they are now appealing that the E and V office conducts an extended verification process, which includes confirming with the actual petitioners as opposed to just comparing signatures. Here's what he told us. Our view is that um, really us the chief elections officer and the elections and boundaries department to do their job as specified by law to verify the key word that verify you know to verify if the petitioners sign the petition that is your job and so we just the appeal before they always say um, the issue before us that we they make the appeal it's up to the chief elections officer and the government by way of the attorney general. I can assure that she 
were need for gay advice, of which a copy of the letter and a package was delivered to the Attorney General and the Governor General and the um, Chief Elections Officer. Ah, we just say, man, um, we might not need to go waste the court time. Do your job. Do your job, and we don't need to waste the court time at all. The law doesn't even speak to verification mean matching the signature of the elections and boundaries record. Say the package you sent to the, to the uh, three bodies that you have the current address of these persons. Yes. Can you be able to list maybe a couple of them for us? Yes. It, 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 like, for example, um, you have one individual who lives in, like, for example, Olivia Anna. Olivia Anna lives in Roaring Quick. No. All place. right. The people who live in Roaring Quick, Belmopan, Mahogany Heights. Kana Freetown and Barack Road, Kana Mayflower Street. My person registered at 22 Father Road, they live at 3 now. My person lives at Register at Freedom Street. Someone said they live they, in Battlefield Park. One, one of them live in Battlefield Park. So then, would you accept the argument that there are several persons who signed this petition? Don't even live in Port but but you are registered. The petition speaks to once you are registered in Port Leola. So it not really matter where you live now. You are a registered voter in Port Leola. So we'll let you know where it goes if it goes at all. As the new Miss Universe believes, Halima Hoy begins to settle into her new journey to the international stage. The Minister of Culture, Francis Fonseca expressed his support for Hoy today, stating that the ministry will be willing to assist her during her reign. We congratulate her. Um, I didn't get a chance to see the pageant myself, but uh, we congratulate her. Um, and of course, we always, Niche always uh, provides our full support to our uh, Miss Universe um, and Belize. Um, as you said, that person is uh, ambassador of Belize um, and cultural ambassador. Um, you know, and so we are ab absolutely prepared to, to work along with her and support her in any way that we can. And, we, you know, we congratulate her. And finally tonight, we're revisiting that global exclusive that UDP leader Shine Barrow gave the Belizean press yesterday when he spoke about the mounting allegations against his one-time mentor, Sean P. Diddy Combs. As Jules Vasquez tells us, it's, it almost didn't happen. How do you feel viewing all that's unfolding with your one-time Northern Star and your role model, Sean P. Diddy Combs? Well, uh, I didn't call the leader of the opposition briefing for that. I, I could I answer. But I could, you can't I, run from the darkness in the night. No, no, no. I'm not interested in discussing um, what is happening in North America. About 30 minutes later, at the end of a lengthy press briefing, Shine Barrow did agree to speak for the first time in many years on the events in that Manhattan nightclub that changed his life. It opens wounds um, when you hear, um, you know, the victim saying that it was Diddy that shot her. That is what is the most remarkable. And that is what stands out to me the most because, you know, I done my best to put it behind me and to move forward uh, and so um, but it certainly reopens the wounds that I've been saying this all along everyone knew all along that I was the fall guy but Barrow would go no further than that and refuse to join the chorus of accusers I'm not going back on that I'm not about to point the finger no I'm not going to get into that well others are doing it sir I'm just saying that I maintain my innocence all this time. I said I was defending myself. I didn't get into who did what. Um, but the victim is telling you who did what. And another, I, I understand that there are other witnesses. Is she, is she accurate, sir? I'm not going to get into that. But for Barrow, the undoing and exposure of his one-time mentor and current financier seems therapeutic. Certainly, I am relieved that 
uh, people are saying what the truth is that you know I did not uh, shoot um, those people. And while he gained some measure of exoneration, he may lose a financier who's also a billionaire. Barrow has very publicly reconciled with Sean Diddy Combs and worked on some partnership. I am appreciative of whatever contributions uh, Diddy has made um, to help the people of Belize. Uh, I wish him well, I pray for him, and I pray for the alleged victims. And, and if, if it is true, may justice be served. If it is not, um, it, it, it's a tragedy because a, a, a global icon um, would have been destroyed. Have you spoken to him to, in solidarity? At least? I've been in touch. Is he one of your financiers? He has supported me openly, yes. You know, we have to work with people and in order to maintain that productive financing relationship, you have to be on on his team. On well, I am on Team Belize. That's what I'm saying. I haven't even, I've gotten a million uh, requests for interviews but I'm not concerned uh, with what is happening in the United States outside of the elected officials uh, that I meet with. Certainly someone um, that has uh, been a supporter and has contributed, this, this is not something that I wish to happen to them. But as I said, uh, justice must prevail. But there's a very specific narrative here saying that you sacrifice your freedom so that he could be free. Yeah. Do you accept that? And if so doing, did you receive anything in exchange for your long incarceration and long and undeserving in incarceration, you say, because you didn't do it, you say? You say, I say, that, that's, you know, that's the Belizean reality. And that's all we have for you on our newscast for tonight. Thanks for watching with your news. I'm Indira Crank. Remember, you can find a full transcript of the news at 7newsbelize.com and see the streaming video on our Facebook or YouTube pages. Have a great night and join me back here tomorrow at the same time.